Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to week four. I guess this is module 4.1. And this week we'll talk about spin. And this is a topic that we touched on actually in week four of part one as well. And of course, at that time, we hadn't talked about this whole quantum transport method, you know, this NEGF equations that we have talked, that we have discussed the last couple of weeks. And so actually in this week, I kind of have two objectives. One is to give you a deeper understanding of this phenomenon of spin, which is very interesting in the sense there are many aspects you can understand just by thinking of it as red and blue. That there are two types of spin, this red and blue, which is kind of what I did in week four of part one. Whereas there are other subtle aspects that really require you to go beyond that. And this week, what we'll, what I hope to do is give you a feeling for these subtle aspects. At the same time, my other purpose is just to show you how our NEGF method, you see the one that we have been developing for the last three weeks in this course, you know, the basic idea that given any device, you have a matrix H that describes your channel two matrices, sigmas, this connect to the connection to the two contacts. And once you have managed to write that down, how you calculate current is, is straightforward. There is this well-defined set of equations, you know, that we have developed. And as we'll see this week, we'll be applying this method to problems involving spin. And the only thing that changes, what we'll have to learn, is how to write these matrices, including spin. But once you have written them, you see, those equations we had, like given the matrices, how we calculate electron density, how we calculate density of states, or how we calculate current, none of that changes. You don't need to relearn any of those equations. It's the same equations, nothing new there. What's new is just how to write these matrices. And so in this module, let's get started with kind of a simplest example. And the example would be a uh, one level device. See, that is, you know, like when we started developing the NEGF equations, we started much the same way. We said, let's think of a device with just one level, epsilon. And of course, now we want to include spin. So it's like there's two levels. There's an up spin and a down spin, as I've mentioned before. Right? So there's epsilon. And then there's another level that's also epsilon. So what it means is when I write the H matrix for this device, previously it would have just been a number almost. It's just a one by one matrix, just epsilon. But now I've got an upspin level and a downspin level. So it's epsilon, epsilon, two of them, zero. That's H. Okay. And in a way, this kind of tells you what's involved in including spin. What you'd find is from an operational point of view, all matrices will kind of become twice as big. Because what used to be one by one is two by two. If you had started with a bigger device that was like 10 by 10, well, it would now be 20 by 20. So it'll be kind of an upspin block and a downspin block to it. So operationally, that's about it really. Although that kind of doesn't do justice to the amount of new physics that comes in as a result. Okay. Now, that's H. Now, the next thing is this sigma that you have to write. Sigma is this coupling to this contact. And that's where, again, if I were just writing a simple, uh, right here, sigma, <clears throat> write it up here. So if I were just writing sigma 1, the simplest version would be that you know, something like minus i gamma over 2 or gamma 1 over 2. 
This is, this is the kind of thing we'd used if you had just one level with, and we were not interested in the spin. So it is just one level. Let me take this off from here. I'll write that here so we have that. Now, corresponding to this sigma, there would be a gamma. As you know, this is gamma is like i times sigma 1 minus sigma 1 dagger, which in this case would be like i times minus i gamma 1 over 2, and then minus i gamma 1 over 2. Because so you take the sigma 1 dagger, and in this case it's just a number, so it's like taking its complex conjugate. So it becomes like plus i, and then there's the minus sign. And the i and the minus i drop off, so this just becomes gamma 1, just that number. So now, so this is what you'd have done if you're not worrying about spin. Now if you want to include spin, then the way you could do it is, let me write this minus i over 2, like before. But now, the gamma 1, you have something for upspin and something else for downspin. And they need not be equal. I see, if I used an ordinary contact, then they would be equal. Up and down can get out equal, equal. But one of the things we discussed in week 4 when we talked about the spin valve device, of course, the, all the interesting things came about because you were using magnetic contacts, where one type of spin was able to get out very easily and the other wasn't. This majority spin and minority spin. That if a magnet points in this direction, then spins in the same direction get out easily, but spins in the opposite direction don't. Okay. So to reflect that, you could use a gamma 1 up and a gamma 1 down. And for the moment, yeah, zero. And so the corresponding, this sigma 1 minus sigma 1 dagger, if you work through it, again, it would basically look just like just this part of it. So this is, let me just write it here. So when I do sigma 1 minus sigma 1 dagger, essentially I'll just get this. So this would be like my gamma 1. And you could do the, same thing uh, with sigma 2. So if you were to write sigma 2 meaning, that's the connection to the second contact. So again, it would be like uh, sigma 2 is equal to minus i over 2, and then gamma 2u, 0, 0, gamma 2d. So this is all, these are all diagonal matrices. And what we'll see in the next module, and <clears throat> gradually we'll go on to more sophisticated examples, where these things actually, there'll be off diagonal elements and how you do all that, that we'll get into. But now that we have written down H, sigmas, etc., you see, it's now fairly straightforward to go ahead and actually calculate the conductance. Now this is where, just to remind you of this NEGF method, we had a set of bunch of equations and what I've written down here is the relevant one that we need here. One is this Green's function, which is EI minus H minus sigma inverse. And then, this is, we are doing just coherent transport. We can use this expression for the current, where this is the quantity that you interpret as the conductance function. And last couple of weeks, we have essentially been plotting that function. And this is exactly what we could try to calculate right now, because what we, we have a gamma 1, we have the gamma 2, we just talked about that. We'll figure out the Green's function, and if you put it in, there'll be a bunch of 2 by 2 matrices to multiply. And usually matrix multiplication is a little messy, but in this case, actually all these are diagonal matrices. So actually multiplying it is also fairly straightforward. So let me just go ahead and try to then evaluate the Green's function first. Okay. So this result then, this thing, let me just, maybe where should I put it? Let me just put it here. 
So we'll have it for future reference. So sigma 1 is equal to minus i over 2. And if you leave out the minus i over 2, what you have there, that's the gamma. That's the coupling to the contacts. This is the simplest version of this, self-energies. So how do we calculate this Green's function? Well, I have to find the inverse of this matrix. And the inverse, so Ei, that basically looks like E, 0, 0, E. Because this I is just a 2 by 2 identity matrix. Minus H, well, H is just epsilon 0, 0, epsilon. Okay. And then there is this minus sigma, and the sigma represents sigma 1 plus sigma 2. It's the two contacts are added there. So I have to take minus sigma 1 and then minus sigma 2. And you'll notice here, there's this minus i over 2. So when I do that, I'll get something like plus i over 2. And then sigma 1 plus sigma 2. So I'll get something like gamma 1 up plus gamma 2 up, 0, 0, gamma 1 up. I'm sorry, gamma 1 down plus gamma 2 down. That's it. And as you'll notice, each one is a diagonal matrix. So when you add it all up, it still looks diagonal. So it would be like E minus epsilon plus I over 2 gamma 1 up plus gamma 2 up. That's what you'd get in the, when I add this, this, and that. And when I add this, this, and that, I'll get Gamma 1 down, plus gamma 2 down. Okay. Now remember, the Green's function is actually the inverse of this. So this is this matrix and I have to invert it. Now because it's a diagonal matrix, actually it's very easy to invert. Because all it means is, it just takes what's on the diagonal and instead of this, write 1 divided by that. That's the inverse. Instead of this, write just 1 divided by that. And these are still zeros. So this is what the Green's function will look like. You see? And the reason the algebra was simple is again because it's diagonal. Otherwise, inverting it would have taken a little more algebra. Okay. That's it. So now you see we are ready to evaluate what we need, namely this trace of gamma 1, g, gamma 2, g, a, that part of it. And so when I multiply out these four matrices, the thing is, oh, each one of these four matrices is actually diagonal. So what I'll have is, let me take this off. So you see, this is GR, and remember I'm trying to multiply gamma 1, GR, gamma 2, GA, and so gamma 1 looks like uh, gamma 1, U, 0, 0, gamma 2, U, I'm sorry. Gamma 1 looks like this will be gamma 1 D. Remember, this part of it is gamma 1. This part of it is this gamma 2 matrix. So I just wrote the, so I've got gamma 1, GR, and then if I want to write gamma 2, that would be like 
your gamma 2 would look like gamma 2u 0 0 gamma 2d. So, I got gamma 1 gr gamma 2 and then if I write ga that is basically the complex conjugate of this quantity because ga is conjugate transpose and this is diagonal so transpose does not matter just the complex conjugate that is what would go in there. Okay. So now the point is that when you have a bunch of matrices like this and they are all diagonal at the end of the day what you get is again just another diagonal matrix. So what you will get is a matrix 0, 0 but there will be a diagonal element here which will be the product of those three, four things and you will get something here that will be the product of those four things. You see, And then when I take the trace of that matrix trace is the sum of the diagonal elements. So it will then be the sum of this plus sum of that. See, So overall what we will get is if I looked at this upper term this times this times this times that one which is the complex conjugate of this what you will get is gamma 1 up gamma 2 up divided by so gamma 1 up gamma 2 up and then divided by this quantity times its complex conjugate which is like this squared plus that square. So I will put that here. So that is what you get in the upper this one one corner. And the one, two, two corner you get kind of the same thing but with down instead of up. And so when you write it out, you will get gamma 1 down, gamma 2 down divided by E minus epsilon square plus gamma 1 down plus gamma 2 down divided by 2 squared. So that's the 1, 1, that's the 2, 2 and when I take trace I just add the 2. So this is then what you might call the conductance function at a given energy. It's the trace of gamma 1 G, gamma 2 G A and because it's all diagonal when you multiply it out it's just this times this times this times this plus what's on the 2, 2 and that's what we have written here. So that's basically the algebra and what I was trying to show you is that at the end of the day in this case what you have got is what you could have said that well you know I have got an up channel and I have got a down channel and the up channel gives me this conductance, the down channel gives me that conductance and you have just added them up. You could have kind of done that and of course the real power, the reason we are doing all this is with matrices you can do more complicated things because right now the problem we are doing is one that you could have done using the kind of ideas we had in part 1 where we just said you know there is a red channel and a blue channel an up and a down just add them up and at the end of the day that is what happened with all these matrices. But what we will do in the next module of course is get on to more complicated things. Now just to get the standard result out of this you can what I will the way you standard result meaning you know one of the devices we talked about in part 1 is this uh, uh, spin valve device and the spin valve device if you remember involves this magnetic contacts where you have these two magnets the contacts and if the co contacts happen to be parallel which means these are both up if these are both in the same direction then you get a lower resistance than if one of them happens to be turned down. Okay, So this, this is the parallel configuration and this is the anti-parallel configuration and 
in part one, we deduced, we obtained this result for why the resistance for parallel is different from the resistance for anti-parallel using a simple resistance model. We said that, well, as if this interface has one resistance for ups, one for down, here you have one for ups, one for downs, and then we used Ohm's law type arguments to get it. Now the same result can come out of this too, but the way it would work is that, you see, we said that, you know, the gamma, this connection to the contact, looks like, you know, gamma 1 up, gamma 1 down, and the other one looks like gamma 2 up, gamma 2 down. And what we could say is that, well, if the magnet, if this up spin is the direction of the magnet, then what will happen is this will be big compared to that because this would be the spin that is opposite to the magnet. So this could be big. I could put an alpha and this could be small. I put a beta with the idea that alpha is greater than beta. So that's one contact. When you go to the other contact, if it's parallel, then you'd say, okay, I'll put alpha and beta again because it's in the same direction, same story. On the other hand, if it's anti-parallel, I could put instead of alpha, I could put beta and in that case, this would become alpha. So from this conductance function that we just obtained, which is general, you could then get results for parallel magnets and anti-parallel magnets by taking the case where, you know, one of, in one case, this is like alpha, beta, alpha, beta. In the other case, it's like alpha, beta, beta, alpha. And this is done in the first homework problem, which I'll discuss in tutorial I guess 4.1. That's where I'll try to explain, you know, starting from here, how you get the kind of results we had earlier in part one for the spin valve from the simple resistor model. Now you'll kind of see it come out of this full-fledged NEGF model. But as I mentioned, this method is, the, the problem we just discussed is a little too simple in the sense that it really doesn't need NEGF and I'm just using it to introduce the method so that we can talk about the more complicated things, which is when the magnets are not just parallel and anti-parallel, but what if the magnets just have some arbitrary direction between them? You see, then using this up-down idea, it would be hard to you write down either a resistor model or write down these matrices, but how you write them down, that's what we'll talk about in the next module.